Microinsurance can be an important tool in helping low-income families cope with risk. The broader financial inclusion community has only recently become more widely aware of the role of microinsurance. Despite this, across the globe there are many instances of microinsurance products being rolled out. And yet, many challenges remain. Many providers are still struggling to find a sustainable model to implement microinsurance. Today, in this first of a three-part series of podcasts on microinsurance, we're going to talk about a report that Microsave recently published on microinsurance in India. I have with, here with me today my colleague Premises, who is the head of the practice group of microinsurance at Microsave. He's going to give us a little bit more information about the report. So, premises, can you start talking maybe a bit about what the report was about, your experiences? Uh, yeah, as you said, there's first of uh, the series, uh, first volume of uh, Securing the Silent, we have focused morely, mostly on life and health microinsurance uh, in India. Mm. And uh, we have taken a view that uh, instead of looking at microinsurance as a, as a segregated financial inclusion product category, we should look at it as a, t as a part of a totality, uh, as part of an overall industrial mm. setup. Because globally, if you uh, look at microinsurance development, uh, it has mostly been developed as a derivative sector. Uh, in African countries, for example, in Kenya, Uganda, and others, uh, insurance companies have actually started uh, doing microinsurance. Uh, while uh, in case of, let's say, Bangladesh, um, it is the NGOs and microfinance institutions which have uh, promoted microinsurance. Mm. In India, and uh, as in a lot of other countries, uh, it is the regulator's will that has promoted microinsurance. Uh, the government and the insurance regulator from the beginning have obliged the commercial insurers to enter into microinsurance. So unless we understand the overall industrial scenario of insurance um, in India, it is really not helpful to understand the microinsurance sector. So, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the pitch of the problem, uh, report, so to say. So I understand from the report, so looking at first life insurance. So it's really been in India, as you say, driven by the commercial insurers and regulation on the other side of it. So I wonder if you could explain a little bit about how that's playing out now. Okay. Uh, well, uh, in India, uh, Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority, IRDA commonly mm -hmm. as known, has uh, required all the commercial insurers to uh, sell a certain number of policies or collect certain percentage of their overall premium or cover a certain number of lives uh, from the rural and socially disadvantaged class. That's from the beginning. So it's no secret that many of the commercial insurers have uh, entered the microinsurance space mainly or in cases only to uh, achieve these uh, mandatory targets. Mm -hmm. So naturally, uh, they had a half-hearted uh, effort towards that. It was a minimalist effort. Mm -hmm. uh, at times, they have reduced their uh, uh, overall uh, uh, agenda into it. And uh, there are lesser and lesser innovation happening in this market. So, uh, and very few of these insurance companies were actually able to sell uh, microinsurance on a sustainable uh, basis. Bearing Life Insurance Corporation of India, LIC as you know it, the public insurers, uh, there are very few private insurance companies who are doing it profitably. Mm -hmm. So, uh, from the beginning, uh, there was a search was on for an alternative to uh, microinsurance for achieving these mandatory targets. Now, if you look at now, 10 years mm -hmm. on, uh, most of the commercial insurers are actually uh, uh, selling more number of rural policies than mandatory requirement, but they are not selling microinsurance to achieve it, which means that they are actually selling their conventional high premium products uh, to the rural affluent classes. It's a bad uh, news for microinsurance because now uh, this regulatory requirement going away, they would be doing less and less mm. towards microinsurance. So that's, that's one of the uh, problem. It's further aggravated by the fact that uh, in recent years, the life insurance industry in India is going through a tough phase. You know, uh, after a decade long of double digit growth, uh, for the first time they have re uh, seen negative growth. Right? Uh, cost consciousness is increasing. Pressure on bottom line is increasing. Many of these insurance companies are closing their branch network. So uh, with this bottom line pressure going on and uh, this cost consciousness increasing, microinsurance would be even less of a focus for them. And uh, what we see is that uh, they, would be, uh, they would be focusing more on cost, uh, low cost alternative for that. Which of course in a sense that it's also an opportune moment for a uh, for lot of low cost highly scalable models, let's say for banking correspondent model mm. or self-help group model, which is scalable, low cost uh, to sell microinsurance, life microinsurance to be precise. Okay. 
But as you'll see that that's the story of life microinsurance. Uh, it's uh, uh, and uh, one the, another part yeah. of this whole report is health microinsurance, which is which doesn't talk the same story. No. So maybe you can talk about it uh, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, as as you've mentioned, it is a very different story in terms of health insurance. There's quite a variety of actors that are involved. There's no one actor that's really driving the sector exclusively. So on the one hand, you've got the community-based insurers. So they are, tend to be a bit smaller. And then on the other hand, you have the really large-scale public sector government schemes, sort of social, social safety net type schemes, uh, which have really been the main story in the last five years. So as I've said, none of these actors really is, is dominating the sector. We have different players doing different things. And at the same time, there's no specific dominant model that's kind of emerged. So there are definitely certain insurers that have opted to uh, give the risk out and sort of engage insurance companies in that. Uh, but at the same time, there's different insurers that are opting to manage it in-house, manage the risk in-house. So either have some sort of mutual scheme. Um, this is both in terms of uh, the community-based schemes as well as the public-based schemes. Okay. So uh, if you look at these two examples, uh, Rosalind, then health and life, we realize that there is a diversity yeah. in this whole uh, microinsurance space. So a unilateral approach in microinsurance doesn't work. Uh, a careful observation of government policies, regulation and uh, the overall industry actually means that this the health and life are two different stories and maybe agriculture would be a different story too. Right, which is how this report fits in. You really need to carefully understand the regulation before you can properly implement a microinsurance model. Yeah, and it also coincides with uh, our experience in, uh, in Asia, Asia and Africa. We have been working with donors, mm. uh, investors, and insurance companies, and banks, and, and microfinance institutions. So one thing is common across in this microinsurance sector is that the players are basically baffled by three dilemmas. There okay. are three dilemmas. One is that what product type should they be implementing, uh, whether okay. it should be life or health or agriculture or property. The second level is that in that particular product type, what is that the client want and what the product features should be. And of course, the third is that if I have a product, how would I market it? So these are the basic three dilemmas that the sector has. And uh, careful observation of this regulation and mm. sector overall uh, helps uh, uh, answering this first question that what product type um, actually should be marketed by a particular organization. Okay. Yeah, I think this is actually pretty interesting. So I think maybe next time we can talk more about this, these three questions, how we can answer them, and Microsave's approach to answering them. Sure, sure, sure.